clearing up confusion tonight on the News 4 Rundown. What to do if you're running into problems with DC's new unemployment benefits system. Plus, I don't want to have to ask for a ride to get across the street. I can now access my community by crossing the street safely. A years long effort to make a dangerous intersection safer and more accessible has finally been achieved. We'll hear from the man who helped make it happen then. Well, there are still some secrets to the metro system. Did you know that there are customer restrooms available and many of them? Take a look inside. They have now been fully renovated. I'm Adam Toss. I'll tell you how you can access these public restrooms, what you need to do with the station manager. I'll tell you about that coming up next. You're watching the News 4 Rundown. And thanks for joining us for the rundown. Our newscast streaming for you. I love it when the, the queue is a flush. Yes. <laughs> I'm Jeremy Adlin. <laughs> I'm Tommy McFly. It is potty time. A little later on with Adam Tuss. Tuesday, March 12th. I'm glad you made it in handily. 75 and sunny today. I was questionable. It was tough out there to come in. Told everybody I parked far away, so the long walk mm -hmm. would just last about 20 minutes. Get those steps in. <laughs> exactly. And we begin tonight with a look at four things for you to know. Lawmakers grilled special counsel Robert Herr on Capitol Hill today. He was asked about his decision not to charge President Biden for mishandling classified documents after he served as vice president. It's Herd's first public statement since the report that questioned Biden's memory, and he stuck to that assessment. A local church school teacher is accused of sexual abuse of minors. Montgomery County police arrested and charged Irvin Giovanno Alfaro Lopez. They say the victims were between the ages of 6 and 12 when they were assaulted, and they were concerned there may be more victims. Ruby Corrado is set to leave a detention center on Wednesday morning after a judge ruled she will not be held until she goes on trial. The founder of a local LGBTQ plus nonprofit is accused of stealing and misusing pandemic relief funds intended for her organization, Casa Ruby. Corrado is facing fraud and money laundering charges. And we're just a step closer now to peak bloom already, folks. Today, the National Park Service announced the cherry blossoms along the Tidal Basin were now in stage four, known as the peduncle elongation stage. Now, all that's left is the puffy white stage before we're in peak bloom. And we are mm -hmm. so ready for it. So much sun. What a difference yeah. today, huh? That one here before we know it, yeah. the dunkle elongation. <laughs> Get used to it. Thousands of people in D.C., Maryland, and Virginia are collecting unemployment insurance through the D.C. Department of Employment Services. The agency launched a new website last month, and it's been causing some confusion for many. Yeah, News 4's Mark Seagraves is working for you. He spoke with the agency's director about what you need to know if you're having problems. More than 10,000 residents from D.C., Maryland, and Virginia are currently collecting unemployment benefits through the district's Department of Employment Services, far below the 200,000 during the pandemic when the agency was experiencing major delays in processing claims. Last month, the agency launched a new website where those receiving and applying for benefits must log in each week. The old system was 40 plus years uh, old, and uh, this new site um, allows our claimants to have a more seamless, user-friendly experience. So it's a completely modernized and new way um, of us doing business and providing this core government service. While the Department of Employment Services Director, Unique Morris Hughes, is eager to promote the new technology, she acknowledges her agency has been getting about 100 calls a week from people having trouble navigating the new system. When that happens, we have a skilled group of folks in our um, customer navigation center that will literally walk you through step by step to make sure you're able to complete uh, a claim. Those issues can include verifying your ID even if you've been collecting unemployment for some time and had been logging into the old system weekly, the new system requires each user verify their ID again in order to access the system for the first time. If you're having trouble, you can call DOES directly at 202-724-7000 or go to their website where they have this online tutorial that will walk you through the process. 
in the district. Mark C. Graves, News 4. Mark, thank you. And that online tutorial to be more accessible. Also, the call center has options for up to a half a dozen different languages. Hmm. Inflation continues to climb, jumping up 3.2% in February over last year. Consumer prices were up four tenths of a point last month, slightly higher than in the previous month. Biggest hurdle to lowering inflation is housing. Those costs jumped in February by 5.7%. The higher than expected figures mean that the Fed could push back plans to lower interest rates. So why is everything so expensive? It's a question you probably ask yourself at the grocery store, when you're buying your kids clothes, when you're buying anything, really. Yeah, it is frustrating and a reality, too. So we decided to take a deep dive into the issue. The economy is actually in very good shape right now. The stock market is soaring. Wages are rising. Unemployment is low. So what gives? News 4 spoke to economic researchers and marketing experts. They say there are a few things at play. First off, inflation is slowing, but recovery is different for every household. Also, lower and middle class families, so-called inflation rate, could be higher than upper class families, putting more pressure on their wallets for longer. Another center is around social media. People are posting a lot about how expensive things are, which leads to greater perception that the economy is worse than reality, and that is called, quote, a vibe session. Mm -hmm. Like, the vibes are off, yeah. man. Vibe check. The last one of the factors could also be most maddening. It's corporate greed. What happened over time is uh, marketers and companies have decided they can continuously increase their prices and they can do that particularly in goods and services that we absolutely need. So why not do that if you can get away with it? Hmm. Read more about our five part digital special report right now on our website and app. Visit NBCWashington.com slash inflation or grab your phone scan the qr code right there on your screen to see maggie moore's reporting and we'll learn more about the vibe session i like that vibe session when was the last time you said oh i got it's such a deal <laughs> i got Look a what vibe. i got yeah <laughs> all right here we go last year's long effort to make a dangerous intersection safer and more accessible has finally come to fruition yeah, this month there's a new blind accessible crosswalk at the intersection of Maryland Route 197 and Lerner Place in Bowie. For years, News 4 has been reporting on the difficulties pedestrians face just trying to cross the street. And today, Mauricio Casillas checks in with a person firsthand, and he spoke to the man uh, who spearheaded this effort. For some, these sound like ordinary beeps. For Matt Barclay, it's the resonant sound of change, change that he's been fighting so hard for. It's very satisfying. We started this process in 2018 when I lost my sight, and I was told from the very beginning that it would never happen. But Barclay didn't take no for an answer. In December 2020, he contacted the News 4i team's Tracy Wilkins. After Tracy shed light on the issue, the state installed a marked crossing and pedestrian signs were put in place. The, the press coverage of that was super helpful in getting the state to say, oops, yeah, we kind of have to do something on this. An important first step, but unfortunately, these safeguards didn't stop many drivers from speeding past Barclay and his guide dog, Neon. So Barclay kept at it and pushed for a safer intersection. His efforts led the state highway administration to green light these all important red lights. Construction on the high intensity activated crosswalk finally began last October. I don't want to have to ask for a ride to get across the street. I can now access my community by crossing the street safely. Wait. What was once a calculated risk is now a much safer path paved by years and years of perseverance. You know, you just keep going and going and going. In Bowie, Mauricio Casillas, News 4. All right. We got to talk about we do. the Caps and Wizards. So there's opposition growing, and it continues to be a rising thing. Boy, is there <laughs> opposition. And, you know, a lot of us aren't surprised because in northern Virginia, people are concerned about traffic. They're concerned about parking, mm -hmm. metro ridership, too. Well, according to a new poll 
out today. 58% of people who live in the neighborhoods around Potomac Yard oppose the project. 29% support it. So residents of Delray, Hume Springs, Lynn Haven, and Rosemont are worried about increased traffic, and they tell the Delray Citizens Association they're also worried about parking and the cost to Alexandria taxpayers. Just last week, Virginia lawmakers served the arena project a major blow when the project was not even included in the General Assembly's 2025 budget. All right, using a restroom along the metro system may not seem like the most appealing experience. Never even crossed my mind. <laughs> Never <laughs> thought about it. Just hold it. <laughs> but the transit agency just finished a 14 year long project to renovate every bathroom in the rail system. News for us. Transportation reporter Adam Tuss is truly working for you touring those bathrooms at Metro Center. <laughs> Welcome to your brand new Metro restrooms. Oh yeah, well, along with riding America's subway system, did you even know that there were customer restrooms available? Let's take a look inside, shall we? Beautiful tile now on the wall, fully renovated bathroom. This is one of 169 Metro restrooms that have now been fully taken care of. I'm pretty sure everybody wants to feel sanitized when they go to the bathroom. Or is that just me? <laughs> no, that's everybody. Okay, just wanted to be sure. <laughs> now, this has been a labor of love for the transit agency. It's taken Metro 14 years to renovate all the restrooms across the system. Yeah. Did you even know that you could use one in the Metro station? Uh, no, I, I thought it was only for like the employees or something. So are you happy that at least they did that? Oh, yeah, I mean, it's good, great to have that option, you know. This one at Metro Center, it gets an A-plus from the News 4 transportation team. All bathrooms are also now fully ADA compliant. Now, in many cases, you do have to ask the station manager to let you in the restroom. Many restrooms are behind locked doors, and that's for security purposes. And Metro says it's working on better signage in stations to let riders know about the restrooms. Just know if you have to go, take comfort that a better restroom experience is waiting for you on your travels. At Metro Center, Adam Tuss, News 4. There you go. He did not flush the day away. Adam did no, some good work today. Not. That uh, door opening got a, got a workout, didn't totally, it? Totally, <laughs> totally. You just hope the bathrooms aren't single tracking anytime soon. and They're exactly. accessible to everyone. Right, I like that. Still ahead on the News 4 Rundown, turning tourism. For the first time in eight years, the ACC Men's Basketball Tournament taking place right here in the district. Why this is a much needed win for local businesses. And a local chef is leading the way in her kitchen while also taking the time to support other women along the way. In today's food fair, we're taking you inside Centralina and her inspiring story. Welcome back to the News 4 Rundown Data Centers. Big money and big community concerns for many Northern Virginia neighborhoods. That's why some Fairfax County residents are fighting for new guidelines when it comes to how these developments are being debated. Today, Fairfax County supervisors indicated they support some changes, but it might be too late for the data center planned next to some brand new townhomes on Edsel Road. Northern Virginia Bureau Chief Julie Carey takes a look at their concerns and the changes that could be coming. They're putting up a new sign today in the Bren Point community, hoping other residents will join their fight against a plan for a data center right next door. Right now, the 56 acres is mostly warehouse space. 500,000 square feet, 70 feet tall, which will, would tower over uh, even these new homes. Neighbor Rebecca Gomez is a first time home buyer here with a newborn son. But we've been kind of fighting this fight for almost the full two years we've been here. The noise from data center generators, one of her biggest worries. 90 decibels is almost the sound of a leaf blower. Can you imagine having a leaf blower in your house constantly? That's, that's the fear. But perhaps the greatest fear, that the neighborhoods impacted will never have a chance to weigh in. That's because a data center is allowed by right under the zoning for this property, meaning no public hearings required. The biggest overarching concern is really that it's allowed to go without any sort of public input. By right does not mean my right to do anything. 
But that lack of public input could be changing. The Board of Supervisors listening to a presentation on possible new rules for data centers. I mean, my goal in this process is to say, hey, data centers are a way of life. They make sense in some areas of the county. Uh, but we also want to have among the strictest guidelines to make sure that we are driving them into those areas that can accept them while making sure that we protect our environment and the communities around these other districts. But new guidelines could limit maximum size and distance from residents. Building design standards could be required to soften the boxy look. HVAC systems and generators might have to be enclosed and noise studies required. The supervisors all seem to agree that revising data center guidelines is an urgent matter. They'd like to have a proposal to vote on by July. This group, hopeful the supervisors may also change the buy right designation in more industrial zones so that residents will get a chance to have their voices heard. In Fairfax County, I'm Julie Carey, News 4. All right, are you hungry? Award-winning mm -hmm. chef Amy Brandwine has been serving her signature Italian cuisine at Citralina in D.C. for nearly 10 years now. We love Centralina. Mm -hmm. All right, she has been nominated for a James Beard Award six times, including this year. About darn time she wins one, yeah. too. And Brandwine is a trailblazer for more than just her work in the kitchen. She's a champion for women in the restaurant industry, opening up Centralina with an all-female leadership team, and women still manage the restaurant today. Anyang shares her story. So we're going to make a dish. It's a... Uh... Perfect for today is uh, called the fiore, so it means flour in Italian, and um, it's really decadent but light pasta. I understood at a very early age when, that women were treated differently than men. My mother, who was a trailblazer in her own right, and um, she taught me that women are meant to be treated equally, that we should be thriving in a workplace, that we should be able to do what it is we want. So this is she, here she is, and this is like 1970 or something, and this is her, she was a sub subcommittee staff director. Um, wow. And these are like the first hearings on sexual harassment in the federal workplace. And it's amazing because you, you see clearly the know who she is because she's <laughs> the only woman in the room. She's the only woman in the room, yeah. And so I saw her get up and go to work every day, you know, put on the full suit. When this is like people, you know, women weren't really working like that at that right. time. She's a single mom and raising me and my brother. Um, and she was just like, she was fierce, you know. She was intent on being who she was and advocating for herself. And um, and so this, this to me is, you know, I, I think of her with pride, and so when I when I when I live my life, I think about the principles that she taught me, and I try my very hardest to, you know, live up to those standards. I started cooking just because I love to cook. I had no idea what I was getting into, you know. So um, I entered a kitchen; it was all men, and you know, uh, I just felt like my mom did, I guess, that you know, if you love to do something, you should just do it, and you know, let the chips fall where they may and go forward, you know. Um, I understood that it was gonna be very hard, and um, but I was kind of determined that if I love to do something, I should be able to do it without being, you know, um, pushed back. So that's why I, I know that women have challenges, you know, and um, we've made a lot of progress, but we haven't made enough progress. I hope that there's people out there that, are, that I can reach that if I'm as honest and truthful as with my struggles, like, you know, how hard it was to fundraise, how very few women chefs there were in D.C. to model my, my business plan after, meaning, like, there's not so many examples of, you know, women chefs at the very, very, very top levels that can point to person that you're pitching and say, you know, yes, I can do this because all these other people have. So, of course, of course, it's going to be successful. So, you know, I choose to talk about those things so that I can reach somebody because I know that everyone has dreams inside. And if somebody encourages you, then you just might need that little spark from somebody that can that that you actually you reach somebody and then they're going to go pursue their dreams. You may not even know that you affected them, but that that is why I that is why I do what I do. Thank you for that on delicious stuff there. And Chef Amy recently expanded opening Piccolina right across the way in 
City Center DC from Centralina. It's a first come first serve kind of casual. I don't know yeah. what she does to her grilled chicken salad, but it is the stuff of dreams. And what was that? That was too beautiful to <laughs> yeah, eat. Whatever amazing. she was making. What an inspiration she is. Yeah. I just love her story and with her mom too. Really cool. Yeah. All right. In other news now, you should also know. Oh, we also want to tell you, Mercata is yes. another one of She got the market as well. Too. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. right across the way. But we've been going there for a while. You can learn more about it, of course, on NBC Washington and all our history stories uh, right here on NBC4. All right, when we come back, it's Blossom Watch. Are you ready for this? Today, the Blossoms on the Tidal Basin have reached stage four of six. Can you believe it? Six? Mm hmm That's where we got to go. I thought it was just one more after four, but it's two more. All four right. Six. Storm Team 4 meteorologist Amelia Draper takes a closer look at why peak bloom is happening earlier and earlier. From Dolby Theater in Los Angeles for the Oscars to the Kennedy Center right here in D.C., actor and D.C. native Jeffrey Wright is delivering the 35th annual Nancy Hanks lecture on arts and public policy. Really great to see him making his first post Oscars appearance back here at home and photojournalist Beth Brown caught up with him just a few minutes ago. It certainly feels good after all of uh, all of that to be back home. You know, I like to ground myself in the things that are familiar and there's no more familiar place than, than uh, Washington DC for me. American fiction so good. He had that nomination and yeah. Wright joins a long list of the nation's preeminent voices in and outside of the arts to give the Nancy Hanks lecture. Good for him coming right back and giving mm -hmm. back. Really cool. Really cool. And speaking of stars, Lenny Kravitz now is one of the stars on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. The rock icon was honored with a star for the recording category today. Yeah, the star sits in front of the Capitol Records Tower. Kravitz has won four Grammys for Best Male Rock Vocal Performance for his songs Fly Away, American Woman Again, and Dig In. Uh, Kravitz's star is the... 2,774 <laughs> star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, in case you're keeping count. Where do they get the space? I mean, it's Los Angeles. It's yeah. pretty It's pretty vast. Exactly. That guy is just like walking cool. Yeah, he is. Or kneeling cool. <laughs> That's right. Well, we are on the Blossom Watch with the cherry blossoms more than halfway to the peak at the Tidal Basin. Today, the National Park Service announced the blossoms has officially reached the fourth stage of growth known as the peduncle elongation stage. It's a very important stage. Mm -hmm. Peak bloom is now just right around the corner with 70% of the Yoshino blossoms are out. That's when we know that it's peak bloom. But as our climate warms, peak bloom happens earlier. Storm Team 4's Amelia Draper has more. The countdown is on. We're just over a week away from peak bloom. We're forecasting peak bloom this year sometime between March 21st and the 26th, similar to last year. But with our changing climate, peak bloom is happening earlier. From 1931 to 1960, average peak bloom was around April 6th. Now from 1981 to 2010, average peak bloom was five days earlier, around April 1st. Now I looked at peak bloom dates for the last 20 years to see more recent trends, I found that peak bloom favored the last week of March, happening eight times during these years. Peak bloom happened even earlier in the third week of March for four of the last 20 years. And of course, there were peak blooms in April, but not as many. There were four years with peak bloom in the first week of April and four years with peak during the second week of April. And as our climate continues to warm, Climate Central forecasts that in less than potentially 50 years, from now, we could have peak bloom happening during the first week of March. Back to you. Amelia, thank you. And not only is it cherry blossom season, it's also ACC tournament time in the district. Here we go. Downtown businesses banking on big bucks from turning tourists. It's been eight years. Did you know that since hmm. DC hosted the ACC men's basketball tournament? And fans have been flocking to Capital One Arena all day to take part. The first round tipped off this afternoon and the ACC championship is on Saturday. And our Dominic Moody spoke with fans outside the arena who say they're excited about the tournament's return to the district. And they're not the only ones. Business and D.C. leaders believe it's imperative to have these events here to keep the local economy strong. College basketball fans are arriving early for the ACC men's basketball tournament as it returns to the district for the first time in eight years. I love coming here. I haven't been to Capital One Arena in a while. 
but uh, it's only two hours from where I live. Gordon Smith is a UVA fan and has attended eight ACC tournaments. Smith and other fans say the tournament host cities always rack up a lot of money. It brings a lot of people, a lot of dollars, a lot of economic opportunity. I do think that the local very close vicinity businesses will do a, 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 a nice uptick on, on, on business. The tournament comes at a crucial time for downtown D.C. as businesses try to cope with the effects of the pandemic and the looming cloud of the Washington Capitals and Washington Wizards potentially moving to northern Virginia. Last month, the Golden Triangle Business Improvement District estimated downtown D.C.'s tax revenues have decreased by $240 million since the pandemic. Nearby businesses have told News 4 they don't want to see the sports teams leave. It's going to have a big, bad impact impact on my business. In 2022, more than 1.86 million people traveled to Capital One Arena, according to the downtown bid group. A key reason why D.C. leaders and business owners want the arena to stay as a primary host for major local events. When there's an event like that, people are coming and dining before the event. They're here in the city, uh, you know, uh, going to hotels. So we know that every event, every conference is a huge uh, boon to the city. Entertainment also around the, the city, the museums, you know, a lot of things to do.